through uh, Revelation chapter 17 this evening. Revelation 17. We're getting along in this book of prophecy pretty far uh, through this book and we're getting to where events are spiraling up and they definitely uh, it's very interesting when you look at good literature uh, every event in the book climaxes right and I mean literally Revelation just follows there's just event after event after event but it's just building and building and building and building and if you have that feeling uh, this evening that you know the, the things that are happening in Revelation are just at the peak of the climax and I'm not a very good movie person unless like I've said before unless the move the acting is terrible if the acting is terrible <laughs> I really can appreciate it I can appreciate a movie with, with terrible acting or uh, you know or just with a corny plot line or something like that but uh, you know in a, in a I guess a well done movie you know the suspense is building and you've got kind of the dun 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 music going on or you know the beats the tempo's picking up and if it's you know Little House on the Prairie, the violins are starting to really play hard, you know, and or whatever it is. But this is if you're watching these events unfold in heaven and you're imagining the circumstances that are going along with these events, this is uh, this is where things are getting very very serious. And I guess the serious climactic event where we ended last week was that there were great hailstones. 750 pounds falling from heaven on men and men curse God men blaspheme God because of the hail what was the cause of the hail their sinfulness and yet they're mad at God for judgment and friend this is such a reminder isn't it that when God judges us we're the cause of judgment. We're the cause. When we're chastised as Christians, we caused it. And it is the most irrational, illogical thing in the world to get angry at God because He's righteous. It's who He is. It's who He must be. And He would be evil if He were not. So here we are in Revelation chapter 17. And if you could just imagine that the, the scene that's described here, this would be one where I don't think you could depict the awesomeness or even the horror of it. So it's better in some instances, I think, just to describe a scene than it would be for us to try to paint a picture of it. But we'll look at this now in chapter 17, verse 1. The Bible says, There came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. And with whom the kings of the earth, verse 2, chapter 17, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Well, Father, I pray that as we begin to look at the events of this Babylon and as we look at the dragon that she is sitting on, I pray that you would help us to have a horror at the awfulness of wickedness and Father, that you would help us to have a hope and Lord as well a, a looking forward to righteous judgment of the wicked. We praise you 
for the scripture that we can look at and know the future from. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this is very descriptive, isn't it? John is one of the seven angels which have said to him, the seven angels uh, are these seven angels of judgment uh, that are representative or holding the judgments of the wrath of God himself. And again, we are seeing God's wrath now. We're seeing God's hand, God's judgment. And one of the seven angels says to John, come up hither, come here. I'm going to show you something. So he's about to see a scene unfold, and he is taken in, in the spirit, the Bible says, into the wilderness. And when he's taken into the wilderness, then he sees this woman who is sitting on a beast or a dragon with seven horns, which are, um, I'm sorry, the dragon has uh, seven horns and, and uh, ten heads. And, um, let's see, I, I, I'm missing that part of it. Um, well, I guess it's further on in our, in our text. In verse, uh, in verse 9, yeah, verse, uh, yeah. Well, that's, a, that's the woman who has on her forehead mystery of Babylon. But in verse 8, the, the woman is sitting upon a beast. And let's look at the description of the beast. I meant to read that. Uh, verse 7. Wherefore did thou did some marvel? I will tell, tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. Now go back with me real quickly, if you will, to, to Revelation chapter 12. And uh, we could see here in verse 3 of Revelation 12. This is when national Israel, the woman who was travailing in birth, remember, was chased or, or attacked by the dragon. Verse 3, There appeared another wonder in heaven, behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. And so we could see here that this beast is the dragon in verse in chapter 17 of and verse 7 and 8 of Revelation. So we see here the affiliation. We know that this beast is described as the one that goes down into perdition. And so it's the devil. It's the Satan. This beast in this instance is. And so we see the affiliation between... Babylon, this woman who represents Babylon, and the dragon. Now we won't have time, the, the text, chapter 17, describes to us about the dragon and about his future and what God's going to do with him and how his judgment is coming. But we don't have time this evening to look at everything. There's so much speculation and so much interpretation of Revelation chapter 17 that I think it would be helpful for us to just ask the question, who is the woman? Babylon, who is this woman? Uh, I grew up being taught, being told, uh, that the woman is, Babylon is, come on, Church. what? The Catholic Church, okay? Now, uh, it's, that's an interesting one for me. Uh, the reason being is that the Catholic Church is evil and is the source of great evil. And so... She really represents a lot of the vice aspects of this woman. But the problem with the Catholic Church is geographic. Right? In other words, I, I've read, if you read, for instance, I think even Matthew Henry's commentary on this, I believe Matthew Henry uh, would, and I'm pretty sure I'm correct about this, would say that the, the, uh, the Babylon is the Catholic Church. And he'd say, if you were to read about, uh, read Jeremiah, is it Jeremiah chapter 50? I believe it is, or 51, Jeremiah chapter 50. Let's go to Jeremiah 50, and we'll look at it real quickly. And he would say, well, you know, Babylon will have already been destroyed physically, and so it cannot be physical Babylon. It must be Rome. Now, I do have a little trouble with that kind of reasoning for this reason. Um, I've, I've been blaming Josiah for how long? For, for a week now for breaking my calf, right, Josiah? So you've been accused of throwing a rock into my leg and been pronounced guilty for it. Okay, so, but you didn't actually do it, right? Okay, so you didn't throw anything at me, you didn't shoot me with your kazoo or anything like that, right? Okay, then it must have been Taj. Right? It wasn't Josiah, so it had to be Taj. Lay says no. Why? Identifying that it's not Josiah doesn't necessarily mean it's... A yeah, just because it isn't Josiah doesn't mean it's Tosh. 
<laughs> and that basically is that's one of the legs of logic for why it is that this Babylon is the Roman Catholic Church. You say, well, Pastor Rome is the city that's set on seven hills. I'm aware of that, and uh, I'm fine you know, with making that likeness. There are other cities that have seven hills as well. So, in other words, the idea that, well, it isn't, well, the, the idea, first of all, that isn't Babylon is one that, if we look at Jeremiah 50, that actually isn't, isn't, isn't a proven case. Uh, actually, it really comes down to what you believe about events that are past, present, and future regarding what God has yet to do and what God hasn't done. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 50, shall we? And let's look at it real quickly. Um, Jeremiah chapter 50. This is where uh, Jeremiah has prophesied that Israel will go into captivity with Babylon. And he's also prophesied uh, Babylon's destruction. And so I want to look at uh, Babylon's destruction prophesied. Let's begin, shall we, in verse uh, 9. For lo, I will raise and cause to come up against Babylon an assembly of great nations from the north country, and they shall set themselves in array against her. From thence she shall be taken. Their arrows shall be as of a mighty expert man. None shall return in vain. And Chaldea shall be a spoil, and all that spoil her shall be satisfied, saith the Lord. Because you are glad, because you rejoiced, O you destroyers of mine heritage, because you are grown fat as the heifer and grass and bellow as bulls. Your mother shall be sore confounded. She that bear you shall be ashamed. Behold, the hindermost of the nations shall be a wilderness, a dry land, and a desert. Now that's certainly true of Babylon today, isn't it? Wilderness, dry land, and desert. Verse 13, Because of the wrath of God it shall not be inhabited, but it shall be wholly desolate. Every one that goeth by Babylon shall be astonished and hiss at all her plagues. Now, look further with me, if you will. Verse 17, the Bible says, Israel's a scattered sheep. The lions have driven him away. First the king of Assyria had devoured him. And last, this Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, hath broken his bones. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will punish the king of Babylon in his land, as I have punished the king of Assyria. And I will bring Israel again to his habitation, and he shall feed on Carmel and Bashan, and his soul shall be satisfied upon Mount Ephraim and Gilead. In those days and in that time, saith the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for, and there shall be none, and the sins of Judah, and they shall not be found, for I will pardon them whom I reserve. Verse 23 how is the hammer of the whole earth cut asunder and broken? How is Babylon become a desolation among the nations? I have laid a snare for thee, and thou art also taken, O Babylon, and thou wast not aware, thou art found and also caught, because thou hast striven against the Lord. And again, we see more prophecy against Babylon. And verse uh, 45, or verse 43, The king of Babylon hath heard the report of them, and his hands waxed feeble. Anguish took hold of him, and pangs as of a woman in travail. Behold, he shall come up like a lion from the swelling of Jordan into the habitation of the strong. But I will make them suddenly run away from her. And who is a chosen man that I may appoint over her? For who is like me? And who will appoint me the time? And who is the shepherd that will stand before me? Therefore, hear ye the counsel of the Lord that he hath taken against Babylon and his purposes that he hath purposed against the land of the Chaldeans. Surely the least of the flock shall draw them out. Surely he shall make their habitation desolate with them. At the noise of the taking of Babylon, the earth is moved, and the cry is heard among the nations. Now I ask you, is this final destruction of Babylon past, present, or future? Yes. You mean the nation of Babylon? Yeah, Babylon, the city. Yes. In other words, well, go back with me to verse 20. In those days, and in that time, saith the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for, and there shall be none. In the days that Babylon's desolation is going to come, the iniquity of Israel and of Judah are going to be sought for and they're not going to be found. Past, present, or future? Future. That most certainly is future, is it not? Okay, so based on, I, on Jeremiah chapter 15, is the destruction of Babylon, which is referenced as in those days when Israel's iniquity and Judah's iniquity are not found, is that past, present, or future? It's future, isn't it? Okay, so for a person, any person who is a theologian to say, Babylon in the Bible isn't Babylon. 
and then to say it's Tosh. You understand what I'm saying? In other words, is, is Islam as evil in its own right as Catholicism? Yeah. I think so. Is any religion which leads men to hell, whether it's a lovely, quote, religion that's full of wealth and riches or a destructive religion that just plunders, is any religion better than Catholicism? I don't think so. So, you know, when we're talking about Rome, we're not really talking about the city so much as we're talking about her emperors and Catholicism. Is it? Would that be true when you're talking about the prophecy of it? Okay, so could any person definitively say that Babylon, as described in the Scripture, is not Babylon? Would there be a reason to say that Babylon, which is, has a future destruction date, could be Babylon? Kind of looks like it, doesn't it? Now, I'm not a pro prophecy guru, and I don't claim to be this evening. You can take that statement and run with it if you like to. I'm just telling you that the tenses of the Scripture mean what they say, say what they mean, and if Babylon's destruction is still a future event, which coincides with Israel's righteousness, that would make sense that it would be when the 144,000 are gathered together to with the Lord Jesus. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be so? In Romans chapter 11, as we looked at last week and the week before, and so all Israel shall be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. The day when 100% of Israel is saved and in truth, that fits the description of Jeremiah chapter 15 and verse 20, doesn't it? When there's national salvation and there's no more iniquity, when there's full forgiveness for the nation, that fits the description. That's a future event. And so I would submit to you this evening that Babylon's Babylon. Just not on the fact that, you know, I've done tons and tons of research about Catholicism and found some really, really interesting things that nobody else would have thought of, but just on the fact that the Bible says so. I, mean, I believe in literal interpretation of the Scripture, as should all of us. The Bible says, knowing this first, and no prophecy of the Scriptures of any private interpretation, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And if it were Roman Catholicism or Islam, I think that it would be the combination of the religions of the world geographically with their headquarters in Babylon. Just because the Bible says it's Babylon. Yes, ma'am? I thought Babylon was not allowed to be rebuilt. I think it will be rebuilt. That's, that's after this destruction that it, that'll be desolate and not rebuilt. But the question is whether or not that destruction, which is prophesied in Jeremiah 50, is past, present, or future. It's going to be in the day that Israel is righteous. So that's a future event, that the time in which Babylon is not able to be rebuilt. And the fact is, is that Babylon, I believe, has some form of habitation today. It's going to be rebuilt in Mesopotamia, basically? I believe so. In other words, the Bible says so. And there's so much opinion from believers that really, and I'll just be honest with you, um, Roman Catholicism, from my lips, from my mouth, hear it from me, Roman Catholicism is as evil as it can be. I'm not here this evening saying, well, Catholicism isn't that bad. I'm just saying that Babylon is Babylon. And anytime you want to make something which is something else into something which is, you, you date you, you date it in history, first of all. It very well could be that the things which are happening today, I'll answer in just a second. It could be that the things which are happening today will lead to a turn of events that will cause Islam and Christianity and the religions of the world to come together in strength. But the reality of it is, is that a person who would take the position that it's Rome really ought to take the position that, you know, that there would be an all-millennial position, that is that there is no millennial reign of Christ and that the events which are prophesied as future events have sort of already happened or would have because that would fit with the emperors of Rome the you know if you if you count the seven emperors of Rome plus the one that was and isn't and the one that will be and then the uh, the one for the interim time but let me read you something about those 10 kings by the way just real quickly and I'll take your question uh, Tajmeen uh, if you go to Revelation chapter 17 
and uh, look at verse 16. The Bible says, The ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast. Oh, wait, I, I, I got ahead of myself here. Okay, verse 12. The ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings. And the Bible says, in, in John's present tense, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. And so many individuals would take go back to Daniel chapter 7, they would look at the kings of Cyrus, uh, Cyrus, the kings of Persia, and the kings of the Medes, and the Babylonian kings, and they would add those up and make them to be. And certainly there could be so, some correlation, except that Revelation chapter 17 and verse 12 says, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. And so verse 13, the Bible says, these have one mind. In order to have one mind, they have to be in concurrence. They have to occur at the same time. And so again, these ten kings are ten kings that are going to be literally alive in the tribulation period. At the now we're past the midpoint of the tribulation, so somewhere before year seven, it's probably in the last half year or last year of the tribulation period, is when we see these kings come together, give their power to the beast, come against the the whore come against uh, the woman and are, are literally in collusion with Satan himself. Okay, what's your point, Pastor? My point is that all the points are null. <laughs> That's really my point this evening. And Charlie, I don't care if you like it or not, it's what the Bible says. <laughs> so you can argue it all you, <laughs> all you like to. Look at him grin. Okay, Taj, what's your question? I never really heard of the Catholic Church. Um, all you have to do is read a commentary, and you can pick your commentary. Most of them yes, Randy? Yeah, I've heard that the, uh, there's two Babylons, the ecclesiastical Babylon mm -hmm. headed up by the Catholic Church, which right, yeah. be in the last times, and then also the political Babylon. And um, that's headed up by the beast, by, by the uh, Antichrist. So, um, you know, then that's where he gets control. Yeah. He finally, he defeats the, you know, the or the, uh, you know, the yeah, well, God's going to destroy both of them. Right. But again, my question is, is Babylon Babylon in this context? Mm -hmm. And the argument that is used to say that it cannot be actual Babylon, that argument is Jeremiah 50. I was going to say, where, where did they derive that argument for the Catholic Church, though? Um, well, it started about the 5th century. It's a historical argument. With no real scriptural... Oh, no, but the Catholic Church was really evil for about a thousand years. Mm -hmm. And when you when you would heap together the evils okay. of religion, you know, or evils of whatever, then the Catholic Church was just really a good example. So of it. Just well, we have a lot of evil religions today. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yes. So that king spoken of in Jeremiah chapter fifteen, Nebuchadnezzar gave it my name there. This this one is going to be destroyed. In Jeremiah fifty, and that that was not the king that was destroyed in this prophecy. No. No. Yeah, because he wouldn't have been, He was a believer. He yeah, a yeah, and that's exactly it. Nebuchadnezzar does. I mean, the, the Nebuchadnezzar, like back in the 1980s, when uh, uh, Saddam Hussein was, uh, you know, uh, raging around in the Middle East, uh, he, according to reports, saw himself as the Nebuchadnezzar, and he saw himself as rebuilding the great city of Babylon mm -hmm. and being a world emperor and ruler and that sort of thing, and so everybody thought. You know, I probably still have somewhere some Saddam. I always call him Saddam Insane because of that parody song somebody did. But uh, Saddam Hussein's um, his. Uh, uh, oh man, I distract myself. But uh, you know, I had some books. You know, that were saying, hey, you know what? He's going to be the, you know, Antichrist and set up this mystery Babylon and so forth. The problem with that is that he was hung by his own people a few years ago, and so that to that just didn't work very well. In, this, you know. uh, in other words, you really... My, and, and, okay, so, so let me draw the conclusion of what I, the point I really want to make this evening. I want to make the point that as Christians, we need to be literalists when it comes to interpreting the Scripture. Whenever you allegorize, whenever the Bible says this is this, then that's what it is. And whenever you try to take something that the Bible says this is this and say, well, this is something else then you have just stepped off into the realm of speculation, of fantastic illustration, but you've just stepped from the known to making things up. And you have just taken Revelation, which is a revealing of a mystery, and you have just cloaked it in, in uh, secrecy. Because 
if you didn't come up with it, then it wouldn't have been come up with. In other words, you think you know something um, extra biblical. And we as believers ought to really, really step back from the arrogance that we could know something that the Word of God doesn't say, or something that the Word of God says is impossible for God and therefore cannot be what God says. And that oftentimes is the position. In other words, to look at this woman and what she represents, and she is symbolic for certain because it says this is what she represents. But she represents Babylon. And that's a future Babylon. And I'm just telling you, friend, the things that are coming are a whole lot worse than anything that's ever been seen. And for us to try to look back and, and talk about the atrocities, things like the Crusades or things like Catholicism when, under, in the Dark Ages and so forth, and to liken those things, the problem with that is that what the Bible describes here is far, far greater than that. And the awfulness of the wicked is something that is unprecedented. The rebellion, the rebellion of man today is the same, but in this age it is greater, it is more audacious, if you will. It is more in God's face than rebellion even is today because we have God in heaven, heaven open, God in heaven's revealed. He's the one who is the source of these judgments. And yet when these terrible judgments happen, man's response is to blaspheme God because of the judgment instead of repent because of the sin. I think we as Christians need to be really careful because when we allegorize, we lessen the picture of the wrath of God, the awfulness and the reality. Listen, my friend, God is not a made-up being. He's a real God, and we will really face Him one day. and We'll really bask in the glory of His presence one day, and it's absolutely wonderful. And so when John is seeing these events, he's not you know, having a dream. He's in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And the things that the Spirit is revealing to him, my friend, are very, very real, and they're very, very much supernatural God. And that is what happens when you take the events of the Revelation literally, is that you begin to see the supernatural God. Because honestly, what we oftentimes do is we try to naturalize miracles. They're miraculous. We try to explain, well, this is you know, Saddam Hussein and his, you know, his tanks. You know, I know I'm telling you the things that they are is a lot worse than Saddam Hussein and his tanks. This is, and whatever. No, my friend, it's exactly what the Bible says it is because it says so. If the Bible says it's like this, or it's similar to this, or the same as this, then it's a likeness. But when the Bible says this is what it is, then this is what it is. And I think it's appropriate, even at this level, at this stage in Revelation, be very, very real about the events that are very, very real. And the, and the things that are described as being very real as well. We understand that the first woman we saw was Israel. The Bible says it was. We understand that the child she had was Jesus Christ. The Bible indicates that that's what it is. We understand that this woman represents Babylon, and that's what it is. And so that's where we'll draw our conclusion here this evening. Father, thank you for what we've learned. Lord, we recognize that as feeble minds, feeble men, we can only know what you tell us. But Lord, I pray that you would help us to be very, very careful not to try to know what you do not tell us and have so much arrogance as to think that we could mandate to you or uh, that we could simply just interpret events. Instead, Father, may we just watch as you do exactly what you say and believe you. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There you go, Charlie. Like it or not.